Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us online for this um, IAEA webinar. Um, I'm very pleased to be chairing the session today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Catherine Costello, and I'm a full professor of global refugee and migration law um, at the Sutherland School of Law in UCD, uh, a recent returnee uh, to Dublin after a long career at the Refugee Studies Centre in Oxford and the Centre for Fundamental Rights at the Harty School in Berlin. Uh, so um, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today. Um, his name is Gerhard Knaus, and he is the founding chairman of the think tank, the European Stability Initiative. Um, he is um, a highly influential author on migration issues, originally from Austria. Um, he's the author of um, a book in German called Welche Grenzen brauchen wir? Uh, which maybe you can see. <laughs> Um, as well as um, a book with Rory Stewart called Can Intervention Work? And um, his work has been highly influential in the development of European asylum and migration policy. Um, today, his title is Addressing the Myths and Misconceptions Amidst the Rise of Right-Wing Populism. Um, I gather, Gerhard, you're going to speak for about 20 minutes. And the way that these webinars work is that you are welcome to pose your questions at any stage through the Q&A function on Zoom. We would invite you to identify yourself and your affiliation if you're posing any questions. Um, and after um, Gerhard's address to us, we will uh, open up the Q&A for discussion and hopefully have a lively and insightful discussion about these uh, very pressing topics. Um, yeah, I think with that, um, I'll hand over to you, Gerhard, and I gather you have a presentation also. Yes, well, thanks a lot. So let me see how that works now. All right, well, superb. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks to the um, IIEA in, in Dublin and to you for inviting me to this uh, um, debate. Um, I will try to cover a few big issues from um, the perspective of somebody who spent much of his time in the east of Europe and, of course, in the center of Europe here in Berlin for the last eight years again. Let me uh, introduce myself quickly. I've been my first job after studying was teaching economics in Ukraine. So I've spent quite a lot of time in in the east, first in Ukraine, then a few years in Bulgaria. That was my first book. Then in Sarajevo for four years working for international organizations where migration and return of displaced following ethnic cleansing was a big issue. And I worked on this in international organizations. And then in Kosovo, where of course also return minority rights were a big issue. I wrote, as you've said, a book in 2011 with Rory Stewart um, on intervention. But the big issue was how to prevent war and expulsion uh, and build democratic peace. Um, and then in 2020, with a new edition last year, which borders do we need in German? Now, I would like to start with something that is perhaps unusual in these debates, which is to say that the continent of forced migration at the moment is Europe. And that's not completely new. The Cold War hopes at the Paris summit in 1990, when all the countries of the continent except one Albania came together and said, from now on, there'll be peace, democracy, and human rights, were immediately dashed in 91. We had mass expulsions in Croatia from the summer, Dubrovnik was bombed. 92, the war in Bosnia erupted with mass expulsions as an explicit goal of war. After three years, we had more than 100,000 dead in Bosnia, and we had millions every second Bosnian expelled. The potential of the kind of nationalism that we saw in these wars, aggressive nationalism in this case by Serbia's president Slobodan Milosevic, to expel millions was always visible. Now, this is actually a European story that most of us who grew up in the West have not fully realized. It started out with the fighting immediately at the end of the Cold War, or even as it ended, Armenia, Azerbaijan. The unresolved conflict in Transnistria led to hundreds of thousands being displaced. Ossetia and Abkhazia and Georgia, wars in the early 90s, unresolved until today. The war in Croatia, I referred to the three years of war in Bosnia. I referred to 98 when the fighting started in Kosovo, displacing hundreds of thousands. And then in 99, one million people as NATO intervened in Serbia. 
We've had hundreds of thousands displaced in Turkey, Council of Europe and NATO member in the fighting between the Turkish military and the PKK in the 90s, hundreds of thousands leaving Southeast Anatolia. We had the first Chechen war in the mid 90s, the second Chechen war when Vladimir Putin came to power, always displacing huge numbers of the resident population. We had a short civil war in North Macedonia, which stopped. We had another war in Georgia in 2008. We had the annexation of Crimea and the beginning again of deportations. Another outbreak of fighting in Southeast Anatolia in 2015. And then of course the war in East Ukraine erupting in 2014, leading to 14,000 deaths and huge numbers of people displaced even before the big war of 2022. Another one in the Caucasus in 2020 and 2023, and then of course the big war in Ukraine. So why, if we look at this map, do we expect this to stop? If we look at this map, at the moment of the biggest refugee movement in Europe since the 1940s, we realize how bizarre it is that in our debate on migration and refugees and forced displacement, um, this issue is not actually the one that should absorb a lot of our attention. Fortunately, it hasn't led to the kind of toxic political reactions that Vladimir Putin certainly expected. The wars in the Caucasus are happening outside of our point of view. We, we don't really notice how many people were killed in Armenia and Azerbaijan as part of the population in 2020. And of course, we might have forgotten the expulsion of 100,000 people from Nagorno-Karabakh last year. We also don't notice that there is a very dangerous nationalist emotion being steered up in the north of Kosovo and in Serbia. Paramilitaries last September with weapons for 100,000 people being stopped in the north of Kosovo. And a football stadiums in Serbia in the last year, uh, regularly fans, these are fans during a football game. Uh, if you read Serbian, you can read the... Uh, writing, Katze Voiska na Kosovo Vrati, when the war, when the army will return to Kosovo. That is every week the major topic in newspapers across Serbia. Military maneuvers, like a few weeks ago, will win with the Serbian president praising the mass production and import of drones. We are heading for more conflicts. So, my question, my first question, as we look at displacement and the future of forced migration, is why do we expect this to stop? And the conclusion is we shouldn't, unless the European Union succeeds, and this is an issue for another debate, uh, unless the European Union succeeds in reversing these dynamics, there will be another war in the Balkans, there will be another war in the Caucasus, there will be more fighting, of course, as it continues now in Ukraine, and we don't know how many people will have to leave Ukraine in the next year or two. The most important root cause of this is Vladimir Putin. I mean, the largest refugee movement in German history in the last few decades has come in 2022. And yes, Germany did also receive hundreds of thousands of asylum applications, but they were a very small number compared to the one million Ukrainians that Germany accepted. This was predictable, but I, I think in uh, the field of migration science, we don't look very much at these kinds of root causes because they are in another field. So the fact that people like Garry Kasparov, the chess world champion and opposition leader in Russia had predicted these kinds of uh, policies already in 2015, that we had seen these policies in Grozny, that we had seen the war in Georgia, that we had been warned by Russian opposition people like Boris Nemtsov. None of this really figured in the debate as we looked at the future, the near future, not the distant future, the near future of forced displacement that affects our democracies most directly. So what is predictable now? Uh, I started with this unusual picture of Europe because it is obvious that expulsion is a very prominent tool, widely and openly discussed in Russian media by people close to the Kremlin, that are exulting in the idea that by the winter, another 10 million Ukrainians might be forced to leave. Now, they are systematically trying to destroy the infrastructure to make life in big cities impossible. And I was just coming back from Moldova. I was in Chisinau last week talking to the energy minister of Moldova and the head of the Moldovan intelligence service. And they are very concerned 
about the extent of damage to the grid and to the uh, basic infrastructure for life in winter in Ukraine. So where next forced displacement? I think as we look at these issues, we should look at Serbia, Belarus, Azerbaijan, and Russia, and integrate what is happening there into the debate on migration. And where might the next million, if it comes to this, or millions, because it depends on the course of the war in Ukraine, of Ukrainian refugees, mainly women and children, go? Here is where they were in December 2023 in Europe. And it is remarkable. Ireland and Germany are, of course, among the top countries, not at the very top. That's the Czech Republic, which has taken in an extraordinary 370,000 Ukrainians, uh, which is a very high share. It's still below the share of Syrians in Turkey, but it's getting there and it happened very quickly. Bulgaria, the Baltic states, Poland, of course, uh, always Cyprus, but then it's already Ireland and Germany. So the debate on what to do, how to prepare for this so that it doesn't lead to the kind of right-wing extremist rise fed, of course, by the Kremlin, which wants Europeans to turn against Ukrainians, that we preempt this is a very important debate. But what you probably expected me to talk about, I do want to talk about also, is the other border. Here, the numbers are very different, much smaller, but not the number of deaths, because Ukrainians, of course, do not need smugglers. They come legally. Uh, they do not need to risk their life crossing that border. Others do. And the status quo at Europe's southern border is, to put it in one word, horrific. It has been horrific for 10 years, from 2014 to 2023, and these are just the IOM numbers. The estimate is 28,000 dead in the Mediterranean. And because I talked about wars before, these are numbers as if there is a war ongoing. I mean, you know, the whole death toll of the troubles in Northern Ireland was below 4,000 over 29 years. So 28,000 deaths at Europe's border is horrendous. And it's not going down. Last year, 2023, 3,900 dead only on the roads, on the routes to Spain and Italy. And these are the cautious IOM figures. We've also had cooperation with Libya, and that's official, started by Italian center-left Minister of Interior, uh, Marco Miniti in 2017. Since then, we've had three other interior ministers in Italy. They all continue it, and all of the EU supports it. And it's been an Irish journalist, Sally Hayden, who's described in great detail, as have many others, but this is, of course, one of the best descriptions, the horror of what happens to the people, more than 120,000 since early 2017, taking back from the sea to Libya into camps by the European Union's partners. We have a politics of fear that has led to the collapse of the rule of law at many EU borders. I mean, this is not something to fear in the future. This is happening or has happened already. In Poland, in late 2021, the Polish parliament, the SEM, the lower house, and the Senate, the upper house, discussed whether to exclude children from the forced expulsions ordered by border guards into the jungle, the, the wild forests of Belarus in winter if they are caught at the border. So the debate wasn't whether pushbacks were illegal, pushbacks were legalized by Polish law, but whether to exclude children. And the lower house won the debate and children were not excluded. This is the law on the books in Poland today. Others in the Baltic states do the same. This is a war, has been the slogan of Viktor Orban. And when we talk about far right extremism, let's not forget he's the longest serving leader of a European government. After Angela Merkel resigned, nobody has been in power as long as he has. And he has built his career on fanning fears of mass migration, and then arguing that his opponents are hypocrites because they say they want to control it, but they don't know how to. Hypocrites who are also incompetent. And on the horizon, of course, we don't know what will happen in November, is the potential that the biggest supporter globally of UNHCR financially, the biggest resettlement country in the world today, still the United States, will return in the hands of somebody who's preparing the most radical anti-refugee agenda that any American president has implemented, certainly since the 50s, since the forced expulsion of millions under President Eisenhower to Mexico. 
Toxic ideas like the Great Replacement, this conspiracy theory concocted by far-right French intellectuals decades ago, which were really on the margin because they sound too crazy. Elites in Europe are trying to uh, increase irregular migration from African and Muslim countries to replace the population because they can then rule them more easily. These crazy ideas that Europe is losing its population have gone mainstream. Trump certainly believes them. And the sense of a loss of control, although the numbers are not comparable to what we've seen coming in as numbers of refugees from Ukraine, the sense of loss of control feeds these fears. So in response, what has Europe done? The Libya model has become the template. Last year, what we've done with Libya is to basically go to a country, say you get money and you stop people. We don't return them. We don't return them because obviously you're not a safe country, but we stop them. No, you stop them and we give you money or we stop them together, but you do the work and we give you the tools, including equipment. The response of course, in Libya, as in Tunisia, as elsewhere, has been horrendous for human rights. People being taken from port cities like Sfax into the desert, dropped there. The point about these kinds of agreements is that Europe is not actually getting into contact with the refugees. So legally, European governments say, we are not really responsible what happens to them later. Which raises the question, and that goes to the heart of the issue, if migration control is possible at all. And I know there is this big scholarly debate, uh, which sometimes strikes me as very far removed from reality because it ignores what is the fundamental fact in the world today, that migration is controlled at most borders, unfortunately, by force. Even the most desperate people can be stopped crossing borders because they are stopped across the world. Australia stopped all boats two times, 2001 and 2013. There is a debate which is interesting about how it was done, but the fact is that no boats are anymore arriving in Australia. So this is, of course, a sea border. And what is striking is that the Labour Party in Australia, back in power, this is their poster. The election has not changed Australia's tough border laws, has fully joined the consensus that any boat needs to be turned away. Israel has built a fence in 2012 and has stopped all crossings from Africa. Israel had a few 10,000 refugees before, mainly from Darfur or Somalia crossing via Egypt. Uh, this is no longer happening. Israel built a fence, but more importantly, it put soldiers on the fence and practices pushbacks. Now, the India-Pakistan border is another famous long border that is being controlled to stop all irregular crossings. The Algerian-Morocco border is also not new. Uh, this has been newly built starting in autumn 2015 uh, and largely completed now Turkey's border with Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, at the moment, if you're in Syria, trying to get into Turkey is almost impossible and it's getting similar on the border with Iran. And finally, of course, what we all see on our television screens, desperate people in Gaza, uh, no security, no food, no health care. Um, Nothing for a dignified life, but they can't get out because soldiers stand in their way. So the often heard argument that somehow, and I hear it in migration debates, we can't really stop migration, always assumes, and it's a noble idea, that the tools that will be used to stop migration will not be the ones that we see practiced around the world. In fact, across the world, few people succeed in crossing borders for that very reason, to find protection. Now, the images we get served in these debates about climate refugees and millions and hundreds of millions about to leave are therefore misleading. It's not that desperation might not increase. It certainly has increased in uh, northern Syria on the border with Turkey or in Gaza. It's just that when states put soldiers with an order to shoot at borders, even the most desperate can't get out. And we know that from Europe from decades ago, because that was the fate of the Jews of the Third Reich trying to get into Switzerland. It's also misleading the way UNHCR presents its numbers, because they suggest that a huge number of people are actually becoming refugees every year. Now, a refugee is somebody who crosses a border and gets protection. 
let's look more closely at the UNHCR figures because they show a deep crisis, but it's a different one from the one we think. Yes, the number of forcibly displaced people, according to UNHCR, has increased doubled in a decade between 2013 and the latest report, end of 2023. But look at the numbers of forcibly displaced before Putin's attack on Ukraine. This is from UNHCR, end of 2021, just before the February 2022 attack. 89 million people forcibly displaced, and you see the 27.1 million refugees, among which almost 6 million are the descendants of the Palestinians, who of course have never crossed the border because it was their grandparents who fled before 1948. If we look now at the number of refugees under UNHCR's mandate, which is a different story, we see this picture. End of 2017, 19.9 million refugees under its mandate in the world. Four years later, it was 21.3. So in these four years in which every year we had the feeling that the number of refugees in the world is exploding, in fact, globally, according to UNHCR, that number only increased by 1.4 million. And of those, a very high number will be children, children born as refugees. In four years, UNHCR estimates that 1.9 million children are born as refugees. They are, of course, counted whether they are born in Uganda or Bangladesh or Turkey or Germany. So 1.4 million more refugees in the world, 1.9 million children born as refugees in the world in those numbers. We're beginning to see that all those violent borders and fences and pushback policies are having a devastating impact. Contrary to what many people think, it's very hard for people anywhere to cross borders and get into countries to get protection. And that's, of course, why the largest number of refugees are in Turkey because Turkey for many years had an open border for Syrians, and that's why the largest number of refugees now are Ukrainians in the EU, because the EU has an open policy. The future of refugee numbers is not determined by root causes. It's determined by policies at borders. The big jump in the global uh, number of refugees under UNHCR's mandate was, of course, between 2021 and 2022, and that is the war, largely the war in Ukraine, not only, but largely. Now, to put the war in Ukraine back in perspective, in four years, increase in the world number of refugees, 1.4 million. In three weeks, increase in the number of refugees just from Ukraine and the European Union, 3 million. The question for us is not, is control possible? That we know. The question is, is humane control possible? Is control possible that respects the human rights conventions that we have given ourselves as democracies decades ago whether it's the convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, the Convention on the Rights of Children, the Convention Against Torture, or of course the Refugee Convention itself. Now, let me say something about the EU-Turkey statement. I know this is always a big debate, but just on the facts, what we see here is the number of crossings from Turkey to Greece every month in the five years, 2014 to 18. And if you add up what has been highlighted here in yellow, the 12 months before the EU-Turkey statement, which started to be implemented, implemented at the end of March 2016, in those 12 months, you had a million people cross from Turkey to Greece. This is completely unprecedented. That has never happened, such a movement across the Mediterranean. Not since, not before. A million people, because Turkey at that time had already more than 2.5 million Syrians. It's now 3.1 million Syrians in temporary protection at this moment in Turkey. A million people cross and then something happened. In April, the numbers drop. Forget the 12 months. Look just at the three months in winter. In January, February, and March, in three winter months, you have 151,000 people crossing. Now, in winter, numbers always go down from when it's easier to cross the sea. Um, so everyone expected in Turkey and elsewhere that, of course, as the sea would become calmer, the numbers would increase. In fact, they dropped like a stone. The three months, January to March, 151,000, compared to three months in summer when it was 5,000, and the three months the next winter, 2017, when in the same three months it was about 4,000 people. So here too, like in Australia and elsewhere, the number of people who crossed was dropping dramatically. We had proposed already in 2015, my colleagues and myself, a paper which we then shared widely, 
how to achieve this without violating human rights. And the idea was that Turkey would agree to take people back from a cutoff date. It would take few people back. But the idea was to deter future arrivals and instead do two things. Offer massive humanitarian support, the biggest in the history of the EU, six billion for four years for the Syrians in Turkey to enable them to send their children to school and offer legal migration for Syrian refugees from Turkey to European countries. We had recommended half a million resettlements in September. By the time this was actually proposed by the Turks, that's important. The Turks offered it to the European Union in March 2016. By the time it was offered, the half a million people we had proposed to take had already crossed. Um, as we then saw in the months and years later, the number of people resettled was much lower. And I'm still not ready to ever celebrate this achievement, this agreement, because we always said, unless 50,000 refugees are resettled, there is little to celebrate. But what did happen was that the number of arrivals cross stopped sharply, and so did the number of deaths. The lesson learned for some Europeans was we have a way, because of course the EU-Turkey agreement was challenged in many courts, many NGOs were very unhappy, but no court ever found it to be unlawful, neither did UNHCR, so it has survived many court challenges. The, the reason it did, we can discuss in more detail, is because it doesn't change any laws. I mean, it basically says we apply current laws. You can only take people back to Turkey if Turkey is in fact safe. So this is why the Danish then passed the law in their parliament saying they would extend this to other countries. They never really did. We can discuss that in more detail. But this is what is being discussed in Germany at the moment. And now, right at this moment, in these weeks in Germany, and for the last few months, the debate has gone through a tremendous shift, a big change. I mean, this man is the prime minister of Nordrhein-Westphalia, the biggest state in Germany, 18 million people, and one of the key players in the Christian Democratic Union. He's a liberal Christian Democrat in alliance with the Greens, Hendrik Wüst. And he has come out last September saying uh, Germany should support safe third country solutions. Agreements like with Turkey and similar to the one that the UK has negotiated with Rwanda. Now, he always said that this can only be done legally, of course, if these countries are truly safe and if there is access to asylum. And he has proposed using and in involving the UNHCR in asylum status determination for those to be sent to a safe third country. This made a quick career. He proposed it. It then went to the basic program of the CDU, which is set to win the next elections. It then entered the EPP, the biggest group in the European Parliament election manifesto. And it's now um, at the center of debates. Many of the German democratic parties are supporting it. The government is at the moment studying it intensively. There have been meetings between the 16 leaders of the German lender and the federal government. There was one meeting last week, and it was agreed that the Federal Ministry of Interior of Germany would prepare detailed scenarios how this could be done, because of course the devil is in the detail, and what the legal, practical, humanitarian, and I would say moral challenges are. I went to Rwanda recently, um, and uh, as did many Germans, uh, politicians, and I was particularly interested in this experience. UNHCR is taking people to Rwanda since 2019. Uh, UNHCR has praised this uh, for years. Rwanda is the only partner today, because Niger is out, that is helping UNHCR evacuate people from the hell of Libya. They are being taken to this emergency transit center that has 700 places. Um, they could be uh, taking more people from Libya there, but here the idea is resettlement. Um, this is run by uh, the Rwandans together with um, UNHCR and others. Uh, UNHCR is doing status determination. This was one of the uh, centers, one of the places. They are doing it all the time. I spent a few hours there talking to people, talking to uh, the people escaping the hell of Libya. Um, accommodation in houses, new buildings, uh, and UNHCR has been praising this. Rwanda has been saying this is proof that people can be safe. But be careful, this is, of course, asylum status determination, not by Rwanda, but by UNHCR. And that is why it is considered safe. Secondly, people are not staying there. They could get an option to stay, but they can resettle. This is the Hope Hostel, one of many places prepared for people that were supposed to come from the UK. I don't think any will come. Labour has said it won't do it after the elections. Um, but Rwanda is prepared, and that's what Rwanda told the Germans. It told the Germans and others in Europe, 
um, we are ready to receive a few thousand people. And we have learned from the UK experience and the courts what is necessary. We've reformed our asylum system. And by the way, we are ready to give everyone who is sent to Rwanda immediately unlimited residence permits. So there is no fear of effort more. Our asylum system uh, is being reformed, but it doesn't matter because anybody who comes here can stay and will be supported on the same conditions. Now, this raises an interesting question from the moral point of view. Could this help reduce deaths? Is this the alternative to the Libya-Tunisia deals, which are spreading? We are discussing Libya-Tunisia deals with Lebanon, with Mauritania, with Morocco. Uh, what I mean is deals where we give countries money and they do whatever they think is necessary to stop people leaving. If people reach Europe and we send them to a safe third country, we are responsible that the conditions are met. So the incentives are completely different. We know that sea rescues are crucial. And uh, it was a crazy idea by Italian governments to attack sea rescuers as responsible for people crossing. But we also know that sea rescues don't stop deaths if arrivals keep going up. In 2016, we had more sea rescues in the central Mediterranean than in any year in history, 180,000 in one year, an armada of boats, uh, Italian state boats, the Carabinieri, the, the, the Coast Guard. Uh, an EU mission, commercial boats, and a large number of NGO boats coordinated by the Italian Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, rescuing 180,000 people. But it was the deadliest year ever on this route, with 4,600 deaths, even more than last year, just on one route, because so many people got into boats. So can one have the goal of zero deaths by having safe third country agreements? And to make this concrete, let me look back at the EU-Turkey effect. I mean, the EU-Turkey agreement reduced numbers of arrivals in the first three months before the agreement to the three months in the summer when arrivals always go up from 151,000 to 5,000. That's 3%. The number of deaths decreased from 366 to seven. The winter after it was 13. If we would have had agreements with safe third countries, Rwanda or others, last year, just for the routes to Italy and Spain, then instead of 215,000 people, which is the number that crossed, if 3% would have crossed, it would have been 6,000. And instead of 3,900 people dying, it would have been 140. Now here, I'm taking something that we know has worked with all its imperfections in reducing numbers of deaths, applying it to routes that we know with real numbers and asking the question, if in one year, safe third country agreements might have saved 3,700 lives last year, is it really uh, immoral to seriously think how we could make them work? Or is it a moral obligation, given that at the moment we have no other proposals on the table to stop thousands of people dying? And is this not the humane control that if it could work with the safeguards our courts impose on us, we need to tackle? the toxic fears of loss of control that has propelled the far right to power in so many countries, from the Netherlands to Italy to, well, we will see, hopefully not, France. So what we propose, and I close, is the paradigm shift, Europe to think of itself like Canada. Now, Canada is not actually very far away from a massive migration crisis. We know at the border between the US and Mexico, every month now more people are being intercepted by the American border guards then crossed last year in a whole year from Africa to the EU. But Canada has a safe third country agreement with the US that was toughened last year. So Canada doesn't want people to arrive spontaneously. But at the same time, Canada has a hugely developed legal migration and refugee resettlement program. The idea of legal migration, the current plan for C is almost 1.4 million. Um, over three years, that's 500,000 a year. But interesting for the refugee issue is that 50,000 of those are supposed to be resettled. And that is an old program that was launched in 1979. The mayor of the Canadian capital at that time uh, invented or proposed it, and it has survived, but civil society is involved in bringing in a certain number of people every year without risking their lives legally. And could we not, and here I end, show how this could work this summer in the channel. Labour does not want to send anyone to Rwanda. 
that is fine. In fact, that's a good thing. Why should Rwanda help Europeans solve a problem that lies in Europe between democracies? But how about Denmark, Austria, the Netherlands, countries that signed a letter recently saying safe third country solutions are the way forward? How about them offering the new Labour government that we, Europeans in the EU, are your safe third country? If we believe it can work, if we offer to the UK that from the 1st of August, anybody who crosses from France then can be returned to us because clearly we are safe third countries. We are safe countries, we are democracies. And then we see the number of boats dropping quickly. Couldn't we show that this can work? Is this not the alternative in the channel? That is also actually affecting Ireland directly. In the channel too, people die, not in the numbers of the Mediterranean, but in November 2021, one instance, more than 20 people drowned. And this year already, I don't know the latest numbers, but it's already every month people drowning in the channel. We define a day X, 1st of August, 1st of September, the sooner the better. And from that moment on, according to all the existing laws, European countries are ready to take people back who cross irregularly. But in return, and at the same time, the UK offers every year to 10,000 or 20,000 to be negotiated people a legal way from the EU for refugees or asylum seekers who have a personal reason to go to the UK, a legal path. The UK offers solidarity. Europe shows that we can control irregular migration and the toxic sense that this is something only between African countries and rich Europeans is removed because what we want to show is we are not against legally taking refugees. We are against the risky, deadly crossing through smugglers. Now, I am I was growing up in Vienna and Vienna is interesting because Austria is on the verge of having a far right party win the next elections, the FPÖ. I mean, it's a, it's a noxious, toxic party. It's pro-Putin, it's uh, in favor of Austria leaving the EU, it's in favor of going, getting out of the refugee convention. Its model is Orban. Uh, we will see the elections in autumn. But Vienna is interesting because that's where most of the asylum seekers and refugees end up. Austria in the last few years was per capita the country that gave most protection after asylum system decisions in the European Union per head. And those who get protection, 70% end up in Vienna. The result was that in 2022, together with the Ukrainians who already arrived, in one year, the net increase of population, net meaning more than those who left and those who came, that's the absolute increase was 50,000. In a city of 2 million people, uh, these are numbers Vienna hasn't seen. Last time it saw them was the year 1900. But at the same time, Vienna has been voted the most livable city in the world. So migration is not the problem if it is handled well. What is a problem is the political effect of fears of loss of control. It's the toxic visions irresponsibly fanned by notions that millions and hundreds of millions of people are on the move, which they aren't trying to get to Europe. It's this toxic vision of fear that leads parties like the FPÖ. Because in Vienna, and that's the final paradox, which of course migration researchers know, the FPÖ is not doing well. It is using the fear of migration with most impact in those parts of Austria where migrants don't stay. If you want to know more, if you want to see our reports detailed on analyzing the UK court decisions on Rwanda, the eu turkey statement, um, the situation in the central Mediterranean, the deaths and the relationship to sea rescues, we have papers on all of this on our website. They are easy to read. They are not written for academic audiences, but for policymakers and the general public but with lots of footnotes and facts. And I look forward to the debate. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Gerald. Um, so I would invite anybody who wants to pose a question directly to do so. I think we have one or two in the Q&A and perhaps um, Gerald, while we're waiting for a couple of questions to come in, I have one on the EU Turkey statement, but I, I might just sort of broaden the lens a little bit. Um, you made a very strong causal claim about the impact of the EU-Turkey statement on arrivals and saying people don't come anymore. And I think the evidence from 
the empirical evidence generally tends to show, of course, policy impacts on movement, uh, but that people find other routes or, um, and in your presentation, you set out a list of figures and said, because these coincide with the EU-Turkey statement, we know they are caused by the EU-Turkey statement. And then you claimed that this was transplantable, that we can take the same policy, put it anywhere else, forget about geography, drivers, root causes, push factors, and that the policy will work in the way that you claimed. And I just wondered how you can defend that empirically um, and as somebody who you know, holds himself out as an expert, the causal claim and that it's simply transplantable into another context. Well, um, I mean, the fact is, I mean, I know, I know this debate uh, around the issue where there have been many claims made that are obviously not true. The people who didn't cross to Greece did not go on other routes across the Mediterranean. We know that in 2016, the people who arrived in the central Mediterranean, for example, with record numbers, were from completely other countries. You know, these were not uh, Syrians, uh, Iraqis, Afghans, Iranians, and, Pakis and, and Pakistanis, which was the top five groups crossing from Turkey. Uh, what we do know also is that people did continue to try to cross. Uh, and of course, the EU-Turkey statement only concerned the sea border, uh, very marginally the land border, but on the land border, Greece has continued to make pushbacks and it didn't concern the border with Bulgaria at all. Uh, so the claim I'm making is that what we saw is that the numbers of people crossing and dying at sea dropped like a stone to three, four percent within days of the decision. And in every other year, from winter to summer, numbers increased every other year, always, for obvious reasons. I mean, this is what anybody in the Coast Guard will tell you. That's what anybody on the islands will tell you, because in winter, actually, it's very dangerous to cross. I mean, the sea is rough. It's difficult. Now, in the summer of 2016, numbers didn't increase. For four years, numbers didn't increase. And we also know that at sea, there were no systematic pushbacks by Greece until the end of the EU-Turkey statement. You know, when I say the end, it's when Turkey said, we no longer take anyone back. That was in March 2020, four years later, exactly four years later. Uh, April 2020, we have the beginning, very well documented by now, of systematic pushbacks by the Greek Coast Guard at sea. So the alternative to the policy of the EU-Turkey statement, which is what my colleagues and I had feared and predicted. Why predicted? Because we talked to policymakers, we followed the debate. It was clear that in Europe, in early 2016, there were two plans on the table. One was the idea of an agreement with Turkey like Angela Merkel wanted. And the other was the agreement, was the plan of Orba, which was close the borders by force with military, force Greece to do pushbacks. That was Orban's plan. Well, this is what we have today. I mean, today, Turkey no longer takes anyone back. There's not been a single organized return from Greece since 2020. Um, but there have been violent pushbacks all the time, including people, as was recently alleged again, but the reports have been around for two years, people being pushed into the sea. I mean, allegations of very serious crimes. I, I know for a fact that people are being captured on the islands, put on plastic boats and sent back out at sea. So, so can you I just interrupt there because, because that sort of touches on the on two related questions that have mm -hmm. come through in the chat that so I suppose in your mind, I think when you say the EU Turkey statement, you mean the EU Turkey statement as I envisaged it working. But of course, it did lead to and continues to lead to mass detention on the Greek islands and human rights violations there. And then obviously, then Turkey stops cooperating and then we get mass pushbacks. And so one of well, we the need the agreement again, no? <laughs> I mean, that's basically but, what I've, if we but, want but, I. I mean, if you're advocating a policy and third countries don't don't engage in this form of cooperation for obvious reasons, then then it's not really a policy fix. And that was a question that came through in a question from Grazina Baranowska, saying, "How do you ex continue to explain ad advocacy of safe third country policies in light of the policy failure of the EU Turkey statement?" because it stops working. 
I mean, even if we accept but, yeah, yeah. No, no, that it worked right. in the beginning, then it stops working. So yes, it's not... it worked for four years, it stopped working. But now, are we interested? I mean, that's my question now as, as researchers, why it stopped working. You know, who was in Ankara in uh, late 2019, the, the months before? I, I mean, I was with my colleagues. We were, we were in Ankara, we were talking to people, we were in Brussels, we were talking to people, we were on the Greek islands. Um, and it was clear that something was going to happen uh, because Turkey said, that the EU had promised things that it didn't deliver. It had promised uh, 6 billion euros, which it had committed as promised. So the 6 billion were actually programmed within four years. Um, the delivery of the money always takes more time in, in Europe and that the Turks could just grudgingly accept, but there was no promise of new money. So the EU, some in the EU, and I remember I can give names. I mean, I wrote about a whole chapter on this on what then collapsed. There were people in, in, in Brussels and in some EU capitals who thought, well, the Turks are bluffing. We, we, we don't give them more money. Um, so that, of course, is crazy. You know, if you want to have a safe third country policy, Turkey did have all these refugees. It still has them. So let me instead, you know, if perhaps just give me 30 seconds and I say what I think should be happening now. I was just in Turkey again. Uh, there are these 3.1 million people, Syrians. Um, there are hundreds, a few hundred thousand others also, but let's focus on the Syrians for a moment. 3.1 million with temporary protection. What is their future? These are, half of them are children. The parents don't want to see them on these boats drowning. Irregular migration is a very hard, hard option for them and, and Greece and the EU is supporting pushbacks. Uh, Turkey at the moment has a debate on whether they could be pulled, pushed back to, to Syria. Where, where they can't. I mean, there is a, a certain number that Turkey has tried to push into the small area of Syria Turkey controls directly itself. Uh, but this is not an option for hundreds of thousands, not to speak millions. It's just simply not an option. And Turkish policymakers know that. So the only option is finding a what UNHCR calls durable solution for 3.1 million people. So my proposal is, and I think migration researchers around the world can push for this, we need a new agreement with Turkey, which learns from the lessons, but builds on new things. We should offer to Turkey, Germany, Greece, others, a coalition uh, to offer every year 60, 70, 80,000 Syrians the chance to come to Europe to work. You know, they are already refugees. We don't need to make a new status determination. We know Syrians get protection. Um, we offer them work migration. There are labor shortages. You can argue for this politically. They will come, um, they will come with their families. And in return, and this is the deal, we promise for five years to take a significant number every year through resettlement. In return, Turkey again says, we will take back anyone who crosses irregularly. But this time we make sure that as in the Rwanda agreement, uh, the people that are being sent back have access to a, safe, a fair asylum system. It could be either UNHCR, and Germany is the second biggest donor of UNHCR, together with Sweden, the fourth biggest donor, and the US and Britain could remind UNHCR that this is what UNHCR had offered to Australia in 2011 in Malaysia. So it's not a new thing. If UNHCR doesn't want to do this now, then what one could do is say, like Turkey, anybody who's being uh, sent back, Turkey accepts that its asylum system, like in Rwanda, is going to be upgraded by, for example, including uh, officials from European countries. Rwanda has accepted that the highest British Court of Appeals president a few years ago is co-president of their Court of Appeals. So this is another option. But let's leave that out for the moment. Turkey says we take a few people from a cutoff date. The idea is like 2016, it stops. Um, but we offer a large number of legal routes. And why only for Syrians? We could also have UNHCR assess claims of Afghans in Turkey and those who get protection I might qualify for resettlement. In return, Turkey offers every year a number three times that to give them a legal residence. So the goal is within five years, Europe takes in three, 400,000 people in an orderly way. So they have a durable solution. Turkey gives a durable status, which turns into long-term residency, right to work and citizenship potentially to another uh, 1.4 million people. We are reducing the potential that this will be like in Lebanon or elsewhere, a forever refugee population. So this is the kind of thinking I think we need now. And I think what we are passively doing at the moment is what political spectrum says, don't talk to these countries for returns or such kind of agreements. And the other part says, 
pushbacks are fine. Let's just double down on pushbacks. Okay, it, it doesn't accord with my understanding of the policy space to say the only tool to, to regulate refugee opportunities is is, is safe how, country agreements. Can I ask you, so about, what is the third There's a, a lot of work on resettlement, on pathways for labor, the labor side, the positive side of refugee inclusion. There is a lot of work going on in that space, but it isn't always tied with safe third country because safe third countries, in my experience, since Europe has been using it since 1990, never work very well. So in your vision for the UK, you've said if the UK could return to safe third countries in Europe, there would be no irregular arrivals, but the UK could return refugees to safe third countries in Europe since 1990 under the Dublin Convention, and that never deterred irregular arrivals. It was just that most irregular arrivals were clandestine arrivals in the backs of trucks. There's no yeah. major increase in numbers of asylum seekers to the UK. It's just in a more visible form. Um, because it I never worked, Dublin. <laughs> That's the point. Dublin had no cutoff date. Dublin, I mean, I am in favor of scrapping Dublin completely because it's a huge effort which really doesn't work. Um, but if we try to reduce the number of boats crossing the channel and people dying in the channel, um, then that is a way. I mean, so listen, what I'm saying okay, is- So for you, it. say third country and Dublin are unrelated policy tools. So you can say that Dublin doesn't work. So a safe third country return from France to Germany under an EU instrument backed up by fingerprints, you say that doesn't work. Whereas an imagined system of safe third country returns to Turkey or to Rwanda, you say that's a policy that works. Yes, because of a huge difference. The goal of safe third country agreements like the Turkey statement, and I mean, I think a lot of people have missed this in the debate. The goal of this is, is to have a very strong psychological effect with a cut off date. The goal is like what the Australians have done. You know, yes, they did a few pushbacks with their boats, but look at the numbers. They were not many, you know, in, in, in two, after 2013, when Operation Sovereign Borders started, they had like 600 in total people that were being pushed back by boats. Uh, what happened was that people stopped getting into boats because it looked hopeless. Now, the Australians did it with awful conditions on the island. So European courts wouldn't allow that. What we need to do is have the same effect. Say it's pointless to get into a boat in France to go to the UK because two weeks later, which is not the case in Dublin, two weeks later, you will back, end up back in the EU. Don't do that. But there is a legal path. Why so, couldn't we try that? So you, you imagine a totally different enforcement apparatus than anything that would be legal. Oh. But I want to turn to, um, I have two fascinating questions from Aideen Elliott, who is the Senior Policy and Research Co Coordinator from Oxfam Ireland. And she says she wanted to challenge the dichotomy between losing lives at sea and deals with two uh, with third countries as the only two options. She says they are not the only two options. Uh, why do we not discuss safe and regular routes to protection? The temporary protection directive activation of people fleeing Ukraine showed that when political will exists, an emergency can be managed entirely differently. Um, and on third country agreements, she points out the global inequality of what you're proposing, because most refugees are in low and middle income countries. And why should we be expecting them to host more uh, rather than the other way around? I've summarized her, her question. No, no, very, very good. Very good. Um, I'm let conscious of time. So we have just a few minutes left. So maybe okay, let me take the second question first. Your on, the, on the global on the global. Um, I mean, UNHCR makes this argument a lot at the moment. Uh, also, the, the responsibility sharing. I mean, I think Europe should take refugees, even if today, of course, there are not many countries in the world that have taken in as many refugees as Poland and Germany and the Czech Republic because of the Ukrainians. And we might take in millions more Ukrainians. And that shouldn't mean that we don't help others. I also think that this debate is distorted by the way UNHCR presents its numbers, because as, as all the experts know, UNHCR counts refugees in Europe only for 10 years, but it counts them in Pakistan for 50. In China, it counted them for, for forever. Um, so when we look at these global figures of refugees, it's not comparing the same with same. You know, In Germany, if you count all the people Germany has taken in in the last 40 years, or the US has taken in, uh, you actually realize that it's the Western countries that have taken in more refugees than the rest of the world. I mean, we are having a big paper on this coming up soon. Uh, I don't know why UNHCR is doing this. Uh, until two years ago, it was also misleadingly claiming that 70% are in poor countries, which using a definition of poverty, which included, you know, South Korea as poor and, uh, and Singapore as poor. Um, 
I think there is, uh, it's, it's not fact-based. I think um, migration researchers should call that out. What we should be doing is having more legal routes to migration and for refugees, I fully agree. The chance is big that we can get that as long as we have centrist parties winning majorities that respond both to the needs of the labor market and to the concern about human rights. I mean, in Germany, the CDU, the SPD, the Liberals, the Greens don't want to see the European Convention on Human Rights being blown up. Uh, the IFD does. Gerd Wilders, I'm not sure. He, if he could, he might destroy these conventions. Marine Le Pen has talked about this in the past too. So we need to keep centrist parties winning elections and they can do that by saying, we will organize migration. Uh, we need migrants. We also will use this to bring in more refugees. Our model is Canada. And if you look at the number of people who Austria gave protection to just in the last few years, uh, per capita number one in Europe, if the rest of the EU would have done just what Austria did under a far, I mean, not a far right, under a, a, a center right government uh, and Minister of Interior, Europe would double the number of protection granted. Canada gives more protection in the end than most European countries. So I, I don't think we should give up on the idea of giving more protection. I just think it's toxic to say, and, and not to fight for more resettlement. I agree with the, the question asked. We should fight for more resettlement. But I tell you, every politician, you know, I'm not an academic, uh, although I, I, I lecture at universities from time to time. I don't write academic papers. I talk to policymakers because in the end, they, they need to be persuaded. And the public that the policymakers need to persuade. And policymakers tell me everywhere, including in Canada, if they lose control of their border, legal migration routes are in danger. Yeah, but if Canada would have a mass influx from the US that looks out of control, it would might scrap its resettlement program. The reverse can also be true. If we have legal control of borders without the brutality, we might argue for many reasons, humanitarian, moral, and economic, that we need more safe and legal routes. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious of time. Um, we had other fascinating questions, which were probing really the wider question about the move to the far right and whether migration, and I might just leave, take this as the final question and then ask you to be brief in your response, but whether this link between, uh, as you asserted, that um, control of migration is necessary in order to av avoid the rise of the far right, whether again that's really Correct. Certainly migration is a topic the far right exploits. And again, this is a question that came through from two of our questions, so I'm summarizing. Um, but that if you look at the real drivers of the rise of the right, you might look at, you know, economic factors or, um, you know, a whole range of other political factors. So I think the way you've portrayed it, and this was what the questioner wanted to ask about, is saying, you know, uh, control of migration is necessary or else we will see a rise of the far right, whether whether that's really borne out. Well, um, I mean, you can look at how they campaign, right? the practical issue. You go to Brandenburg, there are elections in three East German states coming up. You look at the posters, you look at what they say at their events. I mean, I, I tend to argue that we should take seriously what people actually say, and they certainly uh, believe that's what they've been doing, the IFD. And it's not migration alone. And this is, of course, what makes it so dangerous. It's much, much worse. It's uh, the myth of the great replacement. I mean, they are they are making a policy based on facts. Many people cross with myth, where they exaggerate the numbers highly. This is why I agree with all migration researchers who say, wait, let's put numbers in perspective. But of course, the fact is that at the moment, we don't have control. It's not that millions come. But what they are then doing is they are taking the images of control, they are taking the, the high numbers, and then they are creating a myth that there is a threat to European culture. And this is mixed with toxic anti-Muslim prejudice. I mean, uh, this is central to this. It's, it's not neutral. I mean, it's very much focused on one particular group of migrants and basic racism about Africans and, and people from outside of Europe. But this is how they campaign. Now, I don't think we should address all their concerns and many of their concerns are criminal. You know, ethnic cleansing is criminal. Expelling people is criminal. 
Uh, they want to expel people who look different, who are even citizens. But let's not forget that this is a real risk. I've seen it in the Balkans. We've seen it in the US under Eisenhower. He expelled American citizens who were, had Mexican names, had immigrated from Mexico, and he, emigrated, he, he expelled them in the 50s to Mexico. So it's a real risk. The mainstream party position, and this is the big question now, in Germany, as parties face these elections where the AfD, the far right, could be, be the number one in all these East German states with this toxic campaign, is what do they say? And there, I think, they need robust policies that defend human rights conventions, the right to asylum, access for refugees to Germany. Uh, but I tell you, all of these parties know that they also need to have a policy of how you can control things. Um, and then, of course, the paradox for them is that Orban is the one who says, I'm honest. You can't control it without human rights violations. Just be honest. What I argue and my colleagues argue is that that's just not true. If we try hard, if we offer serious incentives, Europe did not try safe third country agreements with other countries in the world because we had a connection criteria which made it impossible. We negotiated once with Turkey. There were no safe third country agreements with African countries Europe ever negotiated. If we give real incentives, why shouldn't African countries be interested to take a few thousand people, given that that would allow us to hold the center together around a pro-human rights and in the end pro-refugee policy. Uh, if a, a last sentence, an anecdote, I will. I went uh, spent a lot of time in the Netherlands the last few years, um, with civil servants, with political parties, different parties in the center. How do you talk to the Netherlands on migration now when the migration minister is somebody who uses uh, extreme far right method terminology because she comes from Get Wilders? I I'm not going to the Netherlands to discuss policy anymore. Great. So perhaps we have the same in France, perhaps we have the same in Austria. Perhaps we are getting to the point when the search for pragmatic solutions in line with control, but without violating human rights. Orban will have many more allies. That's the risk that is real. And that risk I see very clearly. And if people don't see it, perhaps it's because they don't have the same, they don't aren't in the same countries I spend most of my time in, and they don't talk to the same policymakers who ask, how do we fight campaigns? How do we win campaigns? Means how do we win votes with policies that are not Orban? It's a problem for Biden, by the way. I mean, if he loses this election, it will have a lot to do, not only, but his, the economy is not bad. Uh, Trump is, is a felon. But one issue where Biden has failed disastrously has been at the border for many, many reasons. But he's had more pushbacks than under Trump, under title, you know, the, the, the um, pand pandemic uh, title provision. Um, he has had more deaths at the border. He's had many more arrivals, a loss of control. For Trump, this has been a gift. So thank you very much, Daryl. Those were very detailed and comprehensive. Uh, answers. I'm very sorry to those who didn't get through um, in the question. You can write to me. I give them my um, email. I'll share you my email and I, I, my colleagues and I can, I mean, I can I, put the email, email in the chat. Does one see it? Sure. And I mean, I think this, as this was an event of the Future Profing Europe project uh, sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs, I think, and with that in mind, I think what at least two or three of the comments were trying to suggest was that scapegoating migrants um, you know, is something that we should all be aware of, but that the drivers of the far right might be much broader structural questions. And I think that's for discussion uh, at another day. There was uh, reference to Oxfam policy suggestions, Hind the House's work on migration myths and, uh, and other optics on migration that I think are also important. But thank you for sharing your ideas and, uh, and for speaking so candidly and so um, at such length. So, and thank you everybody who joined us. I hope you found the, the discussion useful and stimulating. And thank you to the Institute, uh, the IIEA for hosting today. Thank you everybody for joining us.